we have to be careful about how much we ingest of it. But at the same time, we can't deny that that's a reality. The, the problem in all of this is that we do experience vicarious trauma from watching that. And it taps into some really, you know, whether it's recent incidents that we've experienced um, within our family line, um, it's triggering. watching another episode of the Jew 3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew 3 Project, and I'm so excited to be back with you. Um, I appreciate you, your all uh, thoughts, prayers, and condolences um, in the loss of my grandfather. Um, t- thank you for giving me the space to take time to uh, process that before I jump back on another podcast. So thank you. Um, thank you, Cam, for filling in for me the week before last. And I'm sorry we didn't have an episode uh, we planned to, but there were some scheduling issues there. So we're sorry we missed that week, but we're back um, with another episode of the G3 Project podcast. Today, um, I have a very special guest. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, tell our audience just a little bit about yourself. Yes. So I, my background, I am a master's level therapist. I have worked uh, with trauma survivors for decades. Um, I have uh, worked in multiple settings, Christian settings as well as secular settings in the US, uh, Paris, France, and South Africa. And um, a lot of what I write about and talk about comes from those experiences as well as my own personal story. And um, I've taught uh, master's level counselors and um, also do life coaching, spiritual direction, my husband and I uh, run the Cyrene Movement, which is a space for people of color to deal with racial trauma, as well as um, just encouragement, empowering them. Pretty new, but it, um, that's something that we're really passionate about. And the other, uh, obviously, this is the book. The book is the, my baby, and that's healing racial trauma, the road to resilience. And really, that comes out of my story and the story of so many Black and Indigenous and other people of color who suffered racial trauma in America and, and in South Africa. Yes, and I, I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you for your work. And um, as many of you know that are watching, well, everybody knows, unless they've been living under rock, we've had um, mm-hmm. incident after incident, and these are not new. Amar Aubrey, George Floyd, mm-hmm. uh, Brianna. Um, and there is so much um, trauma by seeing these people, especially in the um, um, the cases where we have video yeah. um, that comes um, in in our soul and through social media, being re-traumatized by seeing things over and over and over again. So I, that's why I wanted you um, to join us today. Uh, when we think about racial trauma, kind of what is racial trauma and how is it different uh, from other other traumas? Right. The, when I think about, like, we'll start with the general kind of trauma that people experience, um, there's a lot of conversation about just being trauma-informed and the reality that everybody on some level have probably experienced some level of trauma. And in that, there's a whole wide range, whether it was abuse early on or um, and maybe it's an abusive situation in the context of a relationship or marriage. Um, there also may be physical trauma, um, there's emotional trauma. The difference with racial trauma is that it really uh, has some of the elements of trauma that is, you know, the average person experiences, but it goes deeper in that it is very much connected to incidents of racism and it goes to the core sense of identity um, for an individual. And so with, with racial trauma, um, you know, we, there are these racist incidents that occur, and they can range. They can range from microaggressions, being tailed in the mall, um, vicarious trauma, watching videos. Um, it can be that we've been physically, uh, literally attacked. Um, it could be that it's, it's just historical trauma. As a, you know, as an African American, just the whole legacy of slavery. Um, it can be transgenerational things that that's passed down stories that have passed down through generations. 
And um, it can be gaslighting is another one um, where we're experiencing something and we're not validated. We're told it's, that's not what we're seeing. That's not what's happening. And so I would say the difference is that with racial trauma, it is, it's insidious and it's ongoing and it's layered and it's compounded. And in that way, it's very different because um, we are constantly bombarded by this and, um, and it, it constantly affects our emotions and our bodies. That is extremely, extremely helpful. Um, when you talk about the effects of it on our, on our bodies, I couldn't help but think about the fact that we're constantly seeing these images, as I mentioned earlier. Um, how does that affect us? Because I, I was talking to somebody the other day and I was like, it can't be healthy for us to constantly watch someone die. And it's not just you see it one time. It is, as you scroll down and you see, it's a consistent um, visual that you see, whether you see the pictures in the um, latest um, murder of um, George Floyd, you see the pictures of a cop with his foot on on um, George's neck. Um, so if you don't see the video, you see the image. And then, you know, the Amar Arbery and the other countless victims seeing those horrific pictures and images Right. How is that affecting us? Is that healthy? Yeah. Uh, the onslaught of those images, is it's not healthy. And the, the, the part that's really difficult is that um, we have to be careful about how much we ingest of it. But at the same time, we can't deny that that's a reality. The, the problem in all of this is that we do experience vicarious trauma from watching that. And it taps into some really, you know, whether it's recent incidents that we've experienced um, within our family line, um, it's triggering in a way um, that, and, and I've, I've found, um, had so many conversations and have seen online, as well as just with friends, that it is really um, causing all sorts of emotions to surface. Anger and um, just a sense of of just depression. Um, for some, it's just this complacency or just kind of giving up uh, or rage. And what happens over time is that, uh, you know, in the with these incidents, we're getting these kind of meta communications where the, when we see an image like that, there is something that's being communicated. And if James Cone talked about that in the cross and the lynching tree, um, Brian Stevenson talks about that with the whole, uh, the, with the lynching memorial. And, and when we think about even Christ and, you know, his being crucified on a hill, like there are messages that are being sent. And, mm -hmm. and those messages are often that be, be afraid. You don't belong here. Um, you're, uh, you know, you're unwanted. You're not worthy. God has abandoned you. There are all sorts of messages. And, and some of them are individual to some of us. Um, but then collectively, these messages are coming across and we've got to address the messages um, because they do damage to our, our minds and to our bodies. Mm -hmm. As you were um, just talking about how it, it affects our view of God when we have racist trauma, I was just having a conversation yesterday and um, the person was trying to untangle um, white evangelical non-responses from yeah. God's responses. Yeah. And it really all stemmed from the racial trauma. So yeah. those things, God's voice and white evangelical voices had got intertwined. Absolutely. So when white evangelicals were silent, they felt like God was silent. Yeah. How do we untangle that or help people untangle that? Yeah. I really believe that part of the, the fundamental piece is that we, we do have to have a sense of what does the word say? What does God say? What is, what is God's heart for his people, you know, um, and for people in general? Um, Jesus came um, to redeem humanity and to save us from our sin. And that was everybody. And, um, but what does scripture specifically say about God's love for his children? Uh, I think that sometimes because we don't, uh, we don't, we're not reading the word. We, we're looking at these externals. We're looking at the evangelical church and wanting, and, and it might be so of saying, okay, it's time to step up and to actually 
live in line with what actually the word says. Um, but I think that un we're going to have to do the work of untangling, and that's going to have to happen within the churches. It's going to have to happen one on one um, with people just sharing the truth of of the gospel and the truth of our story and and our perspective around where is God in the midst of of trauma and trial, and and also just history historically, just the importance of faith in the black community that it can't be denied that. Um, Faith is what carried us through. And um, and so we've got to share those stories with our, our young ones, particularly, who um, and old ones who are now questioning whether God does, or at least, you know, what they can kind of identify or they slot into this um, box that that's white Jesus and a white man's religion, when in fact it's not. That is extremely, extremely helpful. What other ways would you suggest that we pro we uh, that are helpful in processing racial trauma that you um, haven't already shared that you think would be helpful for people? Well, you know, one of the things I, I, I think is really important is that we're honest about how we feel. Um, and I think that we oftentimes, because of our history, we've had to be silent, mm -hmm. silent rather. So silence meant survival for us, mm -hmm. for our ancestors. And so some of us are still silent um, mm. and that we're not sharing what is actually going on in our hearts. Um, and then we also have within the black community, a reluctance to go there, it, as particularly mm. around emotional issues um, and mental wholeness, mental wellness. Uh, and more and more, we're, we're starting to really step into that, into being honest. Um, with ourselves, with other people, bringing them in so we're not alone and we're not isolated, uh, um, and also honest in our relationship with God. So the first part would be that, is to be honest, um, to look at how are the ways in which I, as an individual, uh, I respond to racial trauma. You know, do I go to the place of just denying it, like I don't want to deal with it, so let me ignore it or downplay it, and, and I understand that. Partly, you know, we've had to continue to work, continue to raise our families and in the midst of such horrific times. And um, so there is a need to kind of pull back a bit and, and to regroup and rest. But that but that permanent state of denial is not a healthy one because it it is doing damage to our bodies. Um, another one is just, you know, we're either folding into a place of shame uh, or we're fighting, um, like aggressively fighting in a way that um, is is not productive. Uh, I believe that we do need to fight. We do need to fight systemic racism and oppression, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're in this place of rage all the time, that does damage, does damage to our minds and to our hearts. Um, we Our body is not meant to contain massive amounts of toxic um, emotions, you know, although it's understandable that we're angry. And, and I have to say that this, you know, this past two weeks, I think probably the last four years, <laughs> I've spent my share of, you know, crying out to God and being angry and being sad and all the things that I'm talk talking about, I, I get. Um, and, you know, and then there are some others who just want to forfeit everything or, you know, whether it's um, coming to the place of, I've heard a lot of people saying I'm tired and, and I'm tired as well. Um, but if tiredness means sit down and just give up, um, that's, that's not going to really change anything. And if, if, if forfeiting means that, you know, we forfeit our connection to the community and then we become like the talking heads for white supremacy, that is a serious problem. So we've got to look at what, how are we responding to trauma, uh, being honest about it, and then bringing other people into it, bringing God into that conversation, bringing other people into the conversation, and and just being aware of where am I on any given day? You know, the as we said in the on you know the beginning of this, oftentimes there are videos, there are Facebook, Twitter feed, you know posts that really are triggering. And so being really aware of what am I feeling? What am I um, 
thinking emotionally, um, taking my temperature. And, and because of the climate that we're in right now, we've got to do that on a regular basis. Uh, and then I, I think it's also important to remember uh, because we can feel like nothing is happening, nothing has ever happened. Like there's been no movement for black folk and and yet remembering what you know what our ancestors have gone through that journey and and God in persevering and and um, saving us and walking with us through some really difficult, painful, horrific experiences. And yet in the midst of that, there really has been, you know, the birth of children and weddings and celebrations and life. Um, and so what God has done, what he is doing right now in our lives, and what is what is it that he's promised to do? What are those promises that we really can hold on to? That's extremely helpful. And I love um, how you said bringing God into the conversation, because I oftentimes I think that we aren't comfortable saying it, but we are, our race, a bulk of our race is directed at God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he is all knowing, all wise, all powerful. Um, and he's, he's all loving. So we make assumptions about what he's supposed to do and the time frame in which he's supposed to do it right. and what he allows. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, if you're allowing this, yeah. um, Sometimes people may get the brunt of it because we could see them, but our ultimate anger lies with what we expect from God and being okay with voicing your frustration yeah. and raising anger to him, I think, yeah. adds a, a helpful element to us processing this trauma and this racial trauma that's unique to the Black plight um, in America. Exactly. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, too, that, um, you know, the whole issue around lamenting is really essential in this. It's an important part of that, uh, you know, realizing that God wants relationship with us. And so he wants authenticity. He wants to know what what are we really feeling and, mm -hmm. and thinking. And um, he can handle our hard emotions. And I always go to the Psalms as uh, just their great examples there of, of King David wrestling with God um, and being blunt and with God and the fact that he doesn't understand. It's like, why are the wicked prospering? I don't get it. Like, what are you doing? Um, and there are several, like Sun Chan Ra's book, Prophetic Lament. Um, there's a theologian, Emmanuel um, Katalonge, who's who wrote, he wrote about, lament as a way of just of seeing and standing and wrestling and arguing with God and, and as a way of just hoping in the midst of ruin. And that that's the, the kind of wrestling um, and process that God welcomes with us. Uh, and, and, and in that way, and I believe that even in that wrestling, there's a form of that I engage in those listening prayer and just listening. I'm listening as I'm reading scripture, listening, what is God saying to me in scripture, in prayer, listening, not just talking to God, but listening. And uh, and even listening around what what is he doing? What is it that he wants to do um, in and through me in the midst of this really, really difficult time? That's extremely, extremely helpful. Um, what are the pitfalls um, when venting or using social media as a platform to grieve um, or to express frustration? Does that re-traumatize us? Because you're, you know, I always like to think when I'm really, really angry or frustrated, I run to safe spaces. One of the reasons I don't like to run to social media is because you have people who aren't insensitive to your emotions yeah. that will comment and re to me re-traumatize. Yeah. Um is is social media a safe space? What are some ways that we can use it so we won't re-traumatize ourselves? Right, right. Well, in a way, I, I feel like it does serve a purpose in that we come to see that. 
these experiences are not just ours, you know, like I as an individual am experiencing trauma around what has happened over the last um, two weeks. There are other people who are feeling the same way. So there is a sense of I'm not alone. There are other people who are experiencing that. However, it can become too much. If, if all it is is that um, there's just constantly um, just a layering of images and comments about how angry people are, and I, I get that, we, there, there has to be a place where um, we can take that grief, and I agree with you, safe in a safe space where we can actually process it and get people's real presence because social media can can create kind of an artificial artificial environment for us, um, and and I know that not everybody has that that there are people that they can go to. So I, I understand that, but to the degree that we can, who are those flesh and blood people that we can actually sit down with and cry with, who can, you know, surround us, lay hands, pray on, pray for us, and um, that that's. That's absolutely important uh, because we can come away feeling re-traumatized if we're constantly looping that. And we have, you know, we have um, evidence that whether it's Twitter, social, other social media formats like Facebook, et cetera, like there are algorithms that we end up seeing the things that we end up clicking on. So we're, we're clicking on these videos and we see more of that and more of that. And now I'm not denying or saying that we should know about those things we should uh but the whole thing going back to the whole taking your temperature if you're feeling in a place where you're despairing um and you feel like you're just you know going on a downward spiral it's time to take a break um and just take a break from it breathe um really look at where where are the places where you can pour into your life you know, are you eating well? Are you getting out there and walking? Um, where is God in your life? Are you able to worship? Are you um, able to uh, rejoice? Are, are celebrations a part of, of, of your life? Um, you know, because God is at work. And, um, and so taking that time away, resting, sleeping, absolutely important. Um, it's not sustainable to be on social media 24-7. Um, because it will lead to burnout. Yes, definitely. Um, one of the things that I think many people are wrestling with in this space where our white brothers and sisters aren't necessarily as vocal, and there are some that are waking up to like, okay, I need to be vocal and speaking out. Yeah. Um, what does that process look like on engaging that conversation? Because I think many people are struggling with the whole concept of reconciliation or racial reconciliation being passive. Um, thinking like, you know, many people, especially in when we do, we're doing apologetics in the urban context mm -hmm. or in black spaces, thinking that Christians push on forgiveness and it's not forgiveness that it in their mind just the same forgiveness can't live in the same space yeah. um that they've seen forgiveness being used as a tool of manipulation which it it, it has yeah. historically many people yeah. use it that way yeah and so um oftentimes the way our brain works if people if something's been misused the first thing we think is okay we don't need to engage in that way at all so it's an overcorrection yeah. and the jettison of things that may be helpful yeah. throwing the baby out with the bathwater. How can we strike that balance and understanding justice and forgiveness and reconciliation? Yeah. Um, I, I think that obviously forgiveness is a, you know, it's a command. It's a command in scripture. Um, and, and even beyond scripture, the reality is you, we cannot hold on to unforgiveness. You know, it's instead it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It's us. So we when we hold we hold unforgiveness, it affects us emotionally and physically. That is the reality of it. And scripture says that we're commanded to forgive, and yet forgiveness is a point um, or an action, but it's also a process. And that 
it's not a one off. It's not a, um, in many cases, it takes um, weeks, months, years to actually get to the place where we can then look at that person, the perpetrator, and feel not as triggered or as upset. And we feel like, you know what, I really have released this. I've totally, my hands are totally open. Uh, I've released it. I don't have any, I'm not holding on to anything. And, and so, and that's good. I, I, I'm always concerned about public immediate um, forgiveness. Like I understand for some people's the need to, to do that, um, particularly in very high profile um, incidents. But my concern is mostly out of um, what happens with that. It, it does feel like forgiveness becomes just weaponized so that anyone who isn't there yet um, is, you know, they, they, whatever, they need to get saved or there's something that, something wrong with that. And I feel that in some ways the weaponizing um, causes us not to, um, and, and white folk particularly, not to really look at what happened and the damage that was done. And so, yes, we are to forgive, um, but forgiving someone is not reconciliation. Reconciliation is about relationship. And so the nature of the relationship means that there's a commitment to repair. And that means I'm gonna stop doing what I was doing. So that, that's the second part. It isn't just, I forgive you and you're like, yes, thank you. Um, you know, it, it, there's repair. And so repairing the damage that was done means um, looking at how, um, you know, my privilege, this person, the privilege of a white person, um, how that has done damage and how um, it has done damage as a nation um, and as an individual, as a white person, how, how can I use my privilege to repair some of the damage that was done. And so the step beyond reconciliation um, or forgiveness and reconciliation is the repair part. And just the, that's when you get to the place of authentic relationship. And, and so we're seeing little bits and pieces of this where there are institutions that were built on, you know, the bodies of black men and women who have said, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna own this. You know, and whether there are some churches, there's some universities, and they're like, okay, we're we need to repair the damage. Um, we're not just gonna wash each other's feet, sing kumbaya, and then we walk and leave. You know, we walk into the sunset with our privilege. It's if I'm serious about reconciliation, then I want for my brother and sister exactly what I have. That is extremely, extremely helpful, and I love how you make that distinction about forgiveness and repair and reconciliation and relationship. And, you know, being a person, it once at, when a person forgives a person, that doesn't mean they don't still call the authorities if illegal activity is present. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think people think, you know, if I forgive this person, they won't, I won't get justice. Um, yeah. But a part of it, it's a, it's a comprehensive thing. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted that's... to just say too, just about that whole justice thing, is that, you know, when, when God says, you know, a vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Like ultimately he is going to repay. When we're holding unforgiveness, we're saying, I'm going to do it, or I'm, I'm going to do it in my particular way. And, and I believe that we can definitely pursue justice. Um, and we can also pray that the Lord will meet justice through, whether it's the courts, um, whether it's individually in terms of restorative justice with that person, but we take our, you know, hands off of it and our control of this is what it has to look like. Um, and I am strongly, strongly pro justice and really wanting to, to see that and, um, and particularly if we're if we're going to have authentic relationship going forward and there's going to be true reconciliation, justice has to be a part of, of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's so vital. And I think it's, it's helpful to have, you know, the like you said, a balanced view of it, because because our 
judici- judicial system is so broken. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of justice we won't see here on earth. Yeah. yeah. That's just the reality. Yeah. We could push forward, but there are some people who died and this, and lynched our ancestors yeah. and got away, quote unquote, scot free on earth. Right. So we have to believe that justice isn't just here on earth. It's yeah. something that transcends just this world right. that God, the ultimate judge, will vindicate justice Absolutely. or else we have no hope. If yeah. our if our root or our understanding of justice is just justice the in the here and now, then that is such a hopeless to me view because there are so many people who live evil lives without repentance that just get away scot-free so if i have any kind of hope for a just god i must believe that justice isn't just about the here and now but it has to transcend this world yeah absolutely. Um, absolutely. so i think it's important to to like you said strike that balance because mm-hmm. we are going to see justice i'm we're going to fight for justice here as much as we can absolutely. but there are some people who've already escaped earthly justice mm. and there are some people in the here and now that will escape it because of the broken system and we're uh, we're not able to execute it perfectly so that's why we have to have our hope in the righteous judge Absolutely. who will vindicate us on that on that great day um what other things that any other thing you want to share um before or any last thoughts mm. um on, on this topic of racial trauma that you think is important for our audience to know? Um, I think that, you know, we, we touched on the whole issue of, you know, what are the things that we need to do in just soul care is really important going forward. Um, you know, the reality is that, you know, racism is here. It's baked into America. And so we're, um, and it's not just America, it's around the world. Uh, but how do we, thrive and and while we're actively engaging in um you know tearing down dismantling um systems that, of oppression and and to have that that balance between the two and so we've got to take soul care really really seriously you know what are the ways and the things that really have historically have helped our, our people to, to survive in the midst of that. And I think one thing is that just, um, there was a sense of community, of, of a real collective coming around one another and not just around racism, but around life and thriving and uh, pursuing, pursuing life together. And, and, you know, the whole village raising a child or whatever. Like I I know growing up when I was younger that it was a part of that in our community, um, that we were connected um, to one another. And so we had neighbors who could speak into that. You know, if we were doing something we shouldn't have been doing, um, you know, but they were also our champions. And so, um, and I, I feel like we need to go back to some things that we've lost. Um, the church was essential. It was it was like our bedrock. And there were some who look at the black church particularly and say, eh, you know, um, but the black, I, I firmly believe that we survived because of the church, because that was our place to go where we knew we were welcomed, we were loved, we were respected. Um, it was, and, and yeah, I'm not gonna say all black churches are perfect, but it was a place um, for us to feel that we're seen and known in a very hot, otherwise hostile environment. And so it's looking at those things that worked with our um, ancestors collectively, but also within our families. Um, what has been helpful, what has worked, and from as an individual, what has helped you? Um, mm-hmm. What has helped you to get quiet, to heal, to rest, to restore? What is it that you need uh, because there are things that we know that that really feed us, and you know, yes, it should be the word and worship. Um, but what else is it? Is it dance? Is it is it music? Is it um, journaling? Um, what are some of those things that really help us to stand firm uh, and to continue to walk this out? 
And so being really intentional about that and committing, uh, I'm not going to numb out. I'm not going to run to my addictions. I'm not going to deny it. Um, I'm going to own that that's the reality. And then I'm going to go to the Lord. I'm going to invite other people around me and we're going to walk this out together. That's helpful. Um, I just thought of one more question that I want to ask you. Do you have time for one more? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, and I know some of our white brothers and sisters are listening in and they genuinely want to know how can I care for my black brothers and sisters during this time? Yeah. And I think there is, there is sometimes two extremes people go to. They just reach out to all their black friends randomly and be like, you know, I'm so sorry. And it just kind of, it comes out of nowhere. And people are like, but it, it, it becomes like this weird thing where you're treating, like, how do I engage black people? Like we're animals in a zoo that you have to like mm -hmm. <laughs> give a special yeah. attention to. Yeah. Um, then you have people that just go to the other extreme and don't say anything at all. What is the balance that help like, one, don't be weird, yeah. but also don't be absent. What right. is <laughs> How can, what would you advise them um, um, to do? You know what, I think that just being being a presence. So it is maybe just letting the, your friend know that if they want to talk, that you're available to talk um, and to hear them, to listen rather. Rather than you're talking, you're there to listen. You're just there to listen and to be a presence with them. And if they would like you to pray, asking them to take the lead, in terms of what it is that they need in this moment. So if your friend comes back and, no, oh, I can't talk right now, accept that reality now. Um, or I don't want to talk at all. Or I, I definitely don't want to try to educate you on, on how you need to minister to me right now. So um, I would say one is being a presence, but also doing your homework, doing your homework where you where on, and um, I think that at this point, and people, and you know, for for Black folk, and I'm I'm not going to speak for everybody, but I know for me that the I'm sorry gets old. It just gets old after a while, and that um, like I want to know that my friends care, but I also want to know what are they going to do about it, um, and and I I want prayer but I also want to know what they're going to do about it. Um, you know, cause faith without works is dead. So I, I want both of that. Um, but I also want to just say, let your friend take the lead on that. If your friend has some ideas of ways in which you can assist, um, or suggestions about how you can come alongside and you can engage in activism, whether it's signing a petition, whether it's going to a protest, whether it is praying, whatever it is, ask your friend that is it that is extremely extremely helpful and i think most a lot of people are tired of hearing the i'm sorry yeah. um and i always challenge people to think about like when you're hurt outside of racism what do what frustrates you and oftentimes they'll be frustrated about hearing the repeated i'm sorry yeah. if it's in a romantic relationship they're like i don't want you to keep saying i'm sorry Yep. if the actions are still going to be the same. And so it's like, take that, what you learned over there, and apply it to this relationship. It's, it's, it's different. It's a different type of relationship, but the dynamics of how emotions work are, are very similar. And so if you understand the frustration in, in your romantic situation, in your marriage, you don't want to hear, I'm sorry, over and over again, or mm -hmm. just someone um, just making empty, empty statements, then we don't want to hear it either. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for your time, um, Sheila. How can people get your your book? Um, so you can go on IV Press, so ivpress.com. That's my publisher, Anniversary Press. Uh, you can buy it there. Um, the, you can, uh, Truth's Table is uh, now running a discount special, 40% off. Um, so you can visit um, them. Uh, and obviously, it's at Amazon, but I'm trying to shy away from Amazon. It's big. Mm -hmm. 
um hearts and minds books is another one which is a smaller um outfit um so i would suggest those three ways mm-hmm. of doing it and it's it's available in audiobook uh, a literal book and also an ebook format um you can get all of those yeah awesome well thank you d are you on social media or where what are your handles so it's Sheila Wise Row. It's in every like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's the same thing. Okay. Uh, hashtag or at. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so thank you. so so much uh, for being with us, yeah. and thank you for watching another episode of the Jew Through Project podcast. Remember, you can get our curriculum through Eyes of Color. Um, you can become a monthly por- partner, um, or you can take our online course uh, through Eyes of Color. All can be done at Jew Three Project dot org. We thank you for being with us again. And remember here at the Jew3 Project, we're helping you to know what you believe and why. God bless.